Hey there, welcome to Faith Today, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kara, and we're gonna get things kicked off here in just a moment with our music team coming out to lead us in a few songs. After that, one of our pastors will be coming out to share a great message, and all in all, we'll be here for just over an hour. There's a lot happening at Faith, so before we get started, let's see what's coming up next. A reminder that there will be no evening service tonight as we begin our Kids Blast and Teen Extreme programs. Kids Blast and Teen Extreme is our church-hosted evangelistic outreach opportunity. Meet at the church at 6 o'clock tonight for registration, with services to begin at 6.30. Join the Faith Baptist Church Choir in the loft for our greatly anticipated open choir on June 30th. During the month of July, we will meet each week at either Delco Park in Kettering or Rotary Park in Beaver Creek. Check the lobby table to see which park you've been assigned to, and be sure to pick up some invitations to invite others for these upcoming outdoor services. Again, thanks for joining us today. If you need information about anything that you have seen, connect with us at includefaith.org or on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. With all of that being said, we're going to kick things off here in just a moment. Find your seats if you haven't already as we get started. Thank you so much for that choir. As our music team makes its way down to the platform, let's go ahead and stand and sing this song, How Can I Keep From Singing? Let's sing this to our God in praise and reverence for him. There is an endless song echoed in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock. Shouting your name, I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives, and I will walk with you, knowing you'll see. Sing the songs you gave. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it may. 
Baptist Church. As you make your way back to this, your seats, let's go ahead and continue by seeing Because He Lives, Amen. Jesus Christ, he lives today. 
John chapter 11 and verse 25 says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Let's continue by singing this song, Man of Sorrows. Savior Jesus Christ. His mercy is certainly more than we could ever deserve. So let's sing this last song before we prepare, or as we prepare our hearts for the message. What, what love could remember no wrongs we have had. All missions, all knowing he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without foot on or shore. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. His mercy is more, stronger darkness through every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Since they 
And as you're being seated uh, this morning, uh, I'd like to welcome any first-time guests here with us to Faith Baptist Church. We're so thankful that you would spend part of your weekend here with us at Faith Baptist Church. And for all of our guests here in the room, we only ask that you do one thing, and that is that you fill out this connection card that is in the seat before you. Uh, it helps us to be able to get to know you, to be able to get connected with you so that we're able to serve you uh, better. So if you're a first-time guest, I'd encourage you to take out that connection card right now. And go ahead and fill out as much information as you're comfortable with. And then on the way out uh, this morning, there's, uh, there's going to be some people there uh, with hospitality badges. And they're going to, uh, to help you. They have a gift here for you as well. And if you just turn this card into them, they'll be happy to give you a gift just to say thank you for being with us here at Faith Baptist Church. Uh, just a few announcements uh, before we have our special uh, this morning. Uh, just want to give a reminder, obviously Kids Blast Teen Extreme starts tonight. And as we mentioned in the Up Next video, uh, there is no evening service there is, in lieu of that, Kids Blast and Teen Extreme. Uh, that starts at 6 o'clock for registration. 6.30 is going to be the program start time for that. Uh, for anybody who is a worker who is helping volunteer for Kids Blast and or Teen Extreme, uh, for those individuals and their family, they're welcome to come here at 5.45. We're going to have a meal for you every night at 5.45. That's only for the workers, the volunteers who are uh, helping uh, with Kids Blast and Teen Extreme. We're very thankful for them. Uh, so if you want to plan, if you are a worker and you'd like to participate, participate in the worker meal. That's going to be at 5.40 p.m. starting tonight and then every single night. If you have not registered your kids or your teens, please register them uh, today as soon as possible. That's a help to me so I can get registration uh, squared away before tonight. It'll save you a lot of time as far as typing in all of your information. So you can go to includefaith.org slash kidsblast or Teen Extreme. The information is in the bulletin for that. Um, open choir is coming up for next week, so be aware of that. And then Church in the Park, there's some information there. I do want to make mention of Derek and Maddie's table. Brother Derek, uh, our new staff member, is going to be joining us this upcoming week, and we're very excited for that. Uh, he's going to be working with the student ministry. Uh, there is a table out there, uh, just a welcome table that says, hey, we, we, we want to welcome you uh, to ha help them to cut back on that first grocery bill, because we all know that first gr grocery bill after you're married is a little bit high, trying to get the ketchup, the mayonnaise, all of that, right? Uh, so if you want to help by giving some food items, some uh, laundry detergent, some household goods of that nature, uh, there is a table out there, and you're welcome to, to come uh, and place things uh, throughout this week uh, as they prepare to come uh, this week. Other than that, we have a, a wonderful special here uh, by the Hornbacks, so uh, please open your hearts as they minister, uh, minister to us in song. Bring praise, I will bring praise, no 
Thank you, Hornbacks, uh, plus one, so or two. So <laughs> join me in Luke this morning, Luke 16. Enjoyed praising with you this morning. I trust your heart has been lifted to the eternal realities of who our God is, what he's able to accomplish in and through our lives, and what he has already done on our behalf. And so I want to be thankful that we have the capacity to praise him and the capacity to know him. And so we want to think about that as we look into his word celebrating he is risen. I want you to join me in Luke chapter number 16, Luke chapter number 16, and tonight we think about, as it's on the screen there, Teen Extreme, and so we'll remind ourselves about Kids Blast and Teen Extreme as we embark on this, what is about to be a four-day outreach event, and it takes hours, literally hundreds of hours from a variety of servants to put this on, to plan it, to prepare for it to put it on, and frankly, to clean up after it. And so we do this, and it costs gospel funds. It not only costs man hours, but gospel funds that I trust that you and I have contributed to the church here for their usage as such. And for those serving, it's going to concern, consume your week, isn't it? You know, you're going to have work or whatever you might have this week, and you're going to get off. And I know some of you, it's going to be literally you're leaving one place to go to another they're very cognizant of that. And so it's going to consume the entirety of today through Thursday. It's going to be an awesome week. I'm looking forward to it. I'm pumped about it. If nobody else has a great time, I'm going to have a great time. It's going to be fantastic to preach the word, to be around other brothers and sisters in Christ, to draw those who have never heard about Christ or are still undecided about him. I'm looking forward to young people. I'm looking forward to students coming on campus. I'm looking forward to families being impacted. It's going to be an awesome week, but I remind us, it's going to be a bit of an exhausting week as well as anything worth doing in this life is. So, 
Why do we do it? Why do we do this week or anything associated with trying to tell others about Christ? Why do we attempt to build the next generation of the church to equip them to evangelize and tell their generation about Christ? Why do we put the hours and the money and the prayer and the time into these things? Now, certainly there are many reasons. We could say it's because Jesus, our Savior, has freed us from sin, and so we desire to tell others. That's why we do this, and that's true. We could say it's because Jesus, our Lord, commanded us to engage and tell others, and that would be true. Uh, We could say that Jesus, our victor, has liberated us to serve his eternal purposes, so we get to tell others. And all those are true and valid reasons, scriptural reasons, to conduct personal evangelism or plural evangelism as a church. But this morning, I want us to consider another reason. I one that perhaps we're guilty of not considering starkly enough. Jesus, the righteous judge, will justly turn away the unrighteous at the judgment seat of Christ. And it will be too late for them for us to tell them, quote, one more time. At that point, it will be too late for them to respond in faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ. We, as a church, as Faith Baptist Church, affirm the reality of separation from God for eternity as judged as a sinner condemned. Maybe I could say it a little bit more clinically. We as a church deny annihilationism and believe in eternal conscious torment. My friends, today we would echo the Apostle Paul. Knowing the terror of God, we persuade men. It is this reality that I want us to consider this morning. One that perhaps doesn't receive as much coverage or as much discussion in church because it is a difficult subject matter. It's difficult many times because we have loved ones who did not profess faith in Christ who have passed on and it pains us. It's difficult because we look at the world around us and their rejection of Jesus as their Savior, and it pains us to consider what will take place, that there is a day coming, they'll stand before a righteous judge, and he will justly separate them forever to a place of eternal conscious torment. As I speak this morning, I would ask that you would pray in your heart and ask the Spirit of God to bring forward in your mind those whom he has put in your sphere of influence. Those that you work with, those you live next to, those that are around you, maybe in a daily situation, or maybe in an errand or an appointment situation, I'd ask that you would pray, Spirit of God, please search my heart and highlight in my life those whom I need to engage about in eternity, or those who I have engaged previously and have yet to put their trust in your Son. See, here in our passage that we will read in a moment, we will see that Jesus vouched for eternal destinations, and he clarified how people's response to the Scriptures dictates which destination destination they will abide in. So once you look here, At Luke 16 and verse number 19 with me. Jesus has been reprimanding the Pharisees. He has been condemning the Pharisees. They have been convicted by his teachings in all of chapter 16 in his different parables and stories and teachings. So we come to verse 19, and he gives us a stark and frankly, humanly difficult account to accept Because we always want God to be just a little bit different to us than what he is. We always want God to be more indulgent to us and those we love than a just God can be. And once you see verse 19, Jesus is teaching and he says there was a certain rich man 
which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, note it, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, and neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send Lazarus, him, to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them, those who are alive, hear the revelation of Moses and the prophets that has been given to them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will, note the difference in destination here, repent. They will repent. And Abraham said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, we could put there in parentheses, the revelation of God, neither will they be persuaded. Be persuaded to what? Verse 8, 29 or 30. To repent, though one rose from the dead. We come to this passage, my friends, and Jesus gives us a vouching for eternity and a stark lesson to embrace and act upon in faith. With the reality of eternal torment before us, may we use God's word in this life while there's time in this life, while there's opportunity in this life, while we have the privilege to help reconcile people for the next life. You see, this morning, I want us to consider that we have a mandate, a call, a command, and yea, an opportunity with personal evangelism and plural evangelism as a church, not only because Jesus is Savior, not only because he is our Lord, not only because he is our victor, But my friend today, may it stick afresh in our heart that he is also the righteous judge that people will stand before and they will depart to an eternity in one place or another. If that is the case this morning, may we remember, first of all, everyone dies and will spend eternity somewhere. Everyone dies and will spend eternity somewhere. You know, sometimes we know that, but we don't actively live that reality with those around us. I want you to think everyone dies and will spend an eternity somewhere. And I want you to consider from our passage this morning that death comes for everyone. Uh, We have in this account given on the hills of Jesus' teaching about the folly of a man who loved money and who used his possessions poorly. And in those accounts, Jesus referred, as he has throughout chapter 16, to the validity of the Old Testament scriptures as authoritative from God regarding truth. And though there is differing of opinion here about this passage, is it a parable, is it a historical account, At the end of the day, the stark reality presented is unchanged. Well, I think this might be a parable. I think this is an actual account. The stark reality is there is an eternity. People will spend it either with the Lord you're united or apart from the Lord at all in eternal conscious torment. Jesus is giving a sobering message here to the Pharisees 
that there is an eternity apart from him that they need to take note of and be weary of. And so in our story here, we have in our account Abraham seeing Lazarus and the rich man, and they both pass away. I want to remember here, death comes for all, and death has no prejudice. Think about Jesus' story. It tells of two completely different individuals, right? The rich man, he seems to have financial means and success. Uh, Based on our passage here, he has fine clothing. When it talks about him being clothed in purple, again, that was something in their vernacular or something in their culture that was typical or indicative of royalty or wealth. And so here this individual is in Jesus' account, he has fine clothing. That tells us he's a man of means and money. Uh, He has a place that's big enough to have a gate. So he has a comfortable place to live in this realm. He has opulence to enjoy. Uh, Jesus says that the rich or the poor man wanted just to have the crumbs from the table. All this is to build up in our mind that this individual has it all together and has everything you could ever need in this life. And it becomes more significant for this. Jesus has been reprimanding the Pharisees who believed and taught, if you have God's favor, it's evidenced in your life that you have material blessings. And so here he is reprimanding that teaching by saying, here's somebody who you all as Pharisees would say, look, God has blessed him. Look, he must believe in God. How else could he have all this richness? How else could he have this goodness? This is the Jewish crowd. Listen to this. This is the Pharisees being reprimanded. And so here he is, this rich man. To the world's eyes, he needs absolutely nothing. His life was good. He was, to make a dated reference here, on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous with Robin Leach. Few of us remember that show, right? Maybe the younger generation from 20 years ago would remember Cribs. <laughs> so there you go. He's got it together, right? Man, he doesn't need a thing. He has his own independence, and he is even by the Jewish narrative, obviously he must be good with God, or he wouldn't have all this opulence. And so he's good. He's a good person. He's got it all together. He has not had to look to God for dependence for anything. Now, let me pause and say something. It isn't that being rich is evil. That's not what is being taught here. This is not a passage about God blesses the poor and favors them greater than the rich, though he is a defender of the defenseless. That's not what this passage is about. It's not evil to be rich. But Jesus is speaking to those who look to their riches as an answer to all they need in this life and not to the Lord of this life and the life of beyond this temporary life. And so he points out the rich man and the way he lives. And he points out then Lazarus, who is the polar opposite. Jesus doesn't give us the details, but the poor man, Lazarus, he is destitute. The fact he's laying at the gate leads us to infer that he has some kind of physical malady that has created this situation of poverty. He cannot care for himself. He cannot work for himself. He's destitute. So he has no home, if we could put it that way. He has little to no finances. He has little to no food and no, what we can understand, physical care. So he is there at the rich man's gate, hopeful that someone will care for him, someone will give him alms. It even says that he would have wanted the crumbs from the table. Now I want you to consider this for a second. That could infer and lead us to believe that the rich man's animals, if he had them, ate better than the poor man did. Have you ever had a dog, a small dog maybe? Well, you have an indoor dog that's huge. I don't know. You drop something from the table, where does it go? Gone. Crumbs from your table, you don't need a vacuum, right? My wife is wanting a dog, I think, just for that very reason. We used to have one, just sucked up everything. It was a little hoover, right? (laughs) There's the very possibility here that Jesus is trying to make the point that even the rich man's animals had greater care and nourishment and provision than Lazarus did. Lazarus had absolutely nothing. So in this life, he was viewed as having nothing, worth nothing, and doing nothing. But the fact he, when he dies, 
is placed in Abraham's bosom, a place for them to be reunited for the Lord shows that he, according to the passage, had repented. Though he had nothing in this world, he had looked to the God who controls this world, the God who controls eternity, and he had put his trust in his need of his care and deliverance for his spiritual condition, not his physical condition. And so they have totally different lives. You have the rich man, everything in this life, thinking he's good with God because he has everything. He is sufficient. He is independent. You have Lazarus. He has absolutely nothing, and in his need, in his dependency, in his physical state, he looks greater than the physical state to the spiritual state and looks to his God for an eternal deliverance. And I want you to consider this with me. Death comes for all, and death has no prejudice. No prejudice. And death only leads to two options. Two options for eternity. I want you to look here at verse number 22. He's described how they were living in verses 19 through 21, and we come to verse 22. And it came to pass, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. The contrast between the two individuals continues even in their death. The poor man doesn't seem to receive a burial by the word choice, and yet the rich man does. But the contrast continues after their deaths as well. After Jesus relates the certainty of death, he makes the circumstances and locations in eternity clear. And I want this to sink in. There were two options. There were two destinations that he vouched for. And I'm going to boil it down to this. With God, apart from God. With God, apart from God. After he relates the certainty of death, he makes the circumstances and locations of an eternal state clear. With God, in their time, they called it Abraham's bosom. Uh, Many believe from the scriptures that this was the Old Testament area of where saints dwelt before Jesus liberated him upon his resurrection from the grave, or separated from God in an eternal place called hell, a current place of conscious torment before it is put in or enveloped into the lake of fire in the book of Revelation. Now, here's what I want you to note. They die, and two destinations are given, period. Period. They die, and there's not a measuring of the scales to see how they did. Uh, There's not a, my good works versus my bad works. There wasn't a, well, I'm going to go here for a while and get prayed out of it. There was no third option to either endure or to be granted. There was no bartering. There was no negotiating, young people. There was immediately with God and comfort or separated from God an eternal conscious torment. So I want us to get the picture this morning. As a Sunday morning at church crowd, I want us to be reminded that Jesus has given certainty about the eternal destinations. With him or apart from him. Bliss or torment. And everyone, regardless of what and how they did in this life, will spend eternity in one of those places. Friend, today can I just speak to you for a second, whether you've been here a long time, coming to church, you've heard about Jesus, or this is your first time here today, I want you to be cognizant and thoughtful and aware about this matter. Everyone's going to pass away someday. We know that. And death has no prejudice. It doesn't matter what you've done in this life or who you are or what you think you've accomplished. You're going to spend eternity one of two places. It doesn't matter if you think being a deacon in a church will do it for you, being a pastor or being somebody off the street or being wealthy or of notoriety in this world. All of us will spend eternity somewhere. And so Jesus makes this very clear. Everyone dies and will spend eternity somewhere. But secondly this morning, I want you to consider this. Hell is a place of judgment. And it's important for us to remember Eternal judgment awaits the unsaved. That's not something we want to remember or consider because it is difficult, but eternal judgment awaits the unsaved. 
I want to give a quote here. This account does not see the wicked as being annihilated, but continuing in a terrible, conscious, and irreversible condition after death. You see, the, the rich man passes from this earthly life to his eternal beginning. You know, sometimes when we get older, we talk about being the, 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 the beginning of the end. But it's really not. It's the end of what? The beginning. You and I in this physical life, we're just passing through for a temporary season before we go to our eternal abide. And my friends, may we remember that the rich man passes and he is in hell, a place of torment, a place of judgment, a place that Jesus never desired or intended humanity to end up in. It was a place created for God deniers like the devil and his demons. But after sin entered into mankind's existence through our rebellion towards God, all those who reject Christ will justly be judged and separated from him. As someone who had never repented from his sin and turned to Christ for salvation, if they've never done that, in the Old Testament, if they never trusted the promised Messiah and deliverer of God, there was an eternal judgment, a just judgment, awaiting them due to their unrighteous state. And so here the rich man, he's not welcomed into Abraham's bosom. He's not welcomed into a place with God. He's separated. And Christ vividly describes the reality of hell. Why would Jesus, who was so compassionate, so welcoming to sinners, so merciful, Why would Jesus be so stark, and if I could even say so graphic, in this account? Why would he tell us something so unpalatable about somebody suffering forever apart from him? That doesn't seem like the Jesus who is handing out the bread, not to sound irreverent. It doesn't seem like the Jesus who was healing eyesight, And helping people who would never walk to walk again. It doesn't seem like the Jesus who is teaching spiritual truths and unlocking freedom from people to have access to a relationship with God against the established tradition of the Pharisees. It doesn't seem like the same Jesus. So why would he be so stark? I think because he knows the sinfulness of our hearts. That we would want to downplay it, ignore it, change it, water it down, dilute it. And so he, in this account, gives some elements for us to consider. This place of eternal judgment that awaits the unsaved, it's a place of no relief. Look at verse 23 and see what he says. In hell he lifts up his eyes, and note what he calls it, note what Jesus says, not being there for a little bit, not being in a difficult spot because, well, God's just not there. No, being in torment. And he cries in verse 34 to ask God to have mercy on him. There's no relief for those who leave this life and enter into eternity apart from Christ. This man asks for mercy. What's mercy? It's not giving us what we rightfully deserve. In this case, the torment. What does he ask for? Not a year of relief. Not not to be able to just be out for just a little bit. He asks for one drop of water. The merciless now desires mercy, but will not receive it because the time of grace is over. One author put it like this. The reality of hell's horrors is so terrible that in the picture, even licking water from a fingertip would bring some Welcome relief. My friends, those who leave this life apart from Christ face eternal judgment. That's what awaits them. It's a place of no relief. And we understand from this passage and others, it's a place what seems to be of complete remembrance. Abraham gives two of the most solemn and and hard to hear words. Son, remember. Jesus indicates in this account that this man, he's Jewish in his nationality, that he calls him son. Abraham says that. It's to indicate to us that by nationality, he was Jewish, but not in his faith. Yes, he was a physical descendant of Abraham, but not someone who had faith 
and the Messiah that had been promised by the God of Abraham. So he says here, son, remember. It indicates the reality of hell and cognizance that's going to be with anyone that's there. The rich man recognizes Abraham. The rich man in this account recognizes Lazarus. The rich man, as we'll talk about later, remembers his family members. It seems to be, whether it's only for this account or whether it's true for all eternity, that there's some level of complete understanding and remembrance that is true for those who are separated from Christ. And so, my friends, there's no relief. There's complete remembrance, and I would say there is no escape. Verse 25, what is Abraham reminded of? Son, remember that in thy lifetime thou receives the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And what does he say? Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Abraham reminds him there's no crossing from one side to the other. Not only was the rich man's request for mercy and water not granted because of God's justice, but in addition, the situation in which he found himself was irreversible. Here lies the real horror of this situation. Punishment is eternal. You see, outside of the Lord Jesus, who had the ability to defeat death and be brought back from the grave, There is no changing of the status. There's no escape from eternal judgment. There's no moment of relief. It is an endless prison sentence that has no appeal and will never be shortened. And he ultimately recognizes this is a place of no hope. At verse 27 and verse 28, What does this rich man say? Realizing there's no remedy for himself, what does he naturally do? I've got five brothers. If I can't get out of here and I am in torment, I don't want them, who I remember distinctly, to be here with me. So Abraham, I need you to do something for me. I need just the shred of hope. I can't have the hope for myself, but I want to have hope that those I know won't end up here. I need you to deliver me that morsel of hope. But Abraham reminds them, they've got the word. It's not going to be the way you want it. He begs that somebody would go back and warn his brothers. You know, I'm reminded of Robert Ingersoll, a story I've read that stuck with me about an agnostic lecturer that he was. And he was putting on a presentation or a symposium about how hell was just a figment of the religious to be a fear-manipulating weapon, a crutch against the simple And so he was going to do an entire symposium about it. And somebody walked in as he recorded in this encounter. And he walked in and said, you better make it clear and plain because we're all counting on you. If you're wrong, we're all in a lot of trouble. You see, we may want to deny it. We may want to say it's not going to be forever. But Jesus makes it clear. Death comes for everybody. And you spend eternity somewhere. And eternal judgment awaits the unsaved. That's not very encouraging news, Pastor. It's stark news, stark news we need to remember daily. Well, let's be encouraged about what the remedy is. Faith and God's word can deter that faith. That's what Abraham says here. He says, is this difficult to accept? Yes, it is. So how do we deter that? How do we change that for those around us? Lastly this morning, faith in God's word can deter that faith. Why don't you look at verse 27 and see what he says here. They are sitting here having this discussion, if you could say it that way, one in torment, one in comfort, one separated, one restored. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren. And what does Abraham say, verse 29? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Let your brothers avail themselves and listen to the revelation God has already given them. Abraham reminds the rich man of something. In your life here on the earth, 
It wasn't like God was silent. It wasn't like God had been hateful and unkind and kind of played shell game with the realities of life and the life to come. He reminds him that the God who created us has never fallen silent on the subject of eternity, especially the issue of eternity apart from him. And so he says, they have Moses. That is, they have the five books of the law. They have the prophets, God's continued revelation to the nation of Israel and beyond about their times and the times to come in the future. So get this, Abraham is saying to him, he's citing to him, they have clear teaching in the books of the Old Testament about their holy creator God and that he created them for a relationship with him. They are spiritual creatures that will spend eternity somewhere. And he says to them by saying, Moses and the prophets, you know then that mankind decided to rebel. That's why there is sin and wickedness and evil in this world. Man decided, I will sever and depart from this relationship. And we don't even get past chapter 3 before we see what? God seeking restoration. Man rebels, man ruins it. And you don't even get to chapter 4 before God is trying to extend mercy and grace to humanity to restore what they had ruined and lost. They have Moses. They have the prophets. All of that speaks to a God who is willing to have a relationship, to the issue of unrighteousness that man introduced into the spectrum, and to God's promised deliverance from it through faith and a future Messiah. They needed to trust that what they could not undo as a sinner, God would provide for in a Savior. And so from the Old Testament on, they have been looking to this reality. So God has clearly spoken to mankind. That's what Abraham says. He says it's not an issue of God not speaking. It is an issue of unbelief exclusively. An issue of unbelief exclusively. I want you to see what he says here in verse 30. He's already told them they've got the, the word. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went from the dead, they will repent. They will turn from what they have been trusting in about God themselves and others and they will trust in what he has said. They will believe, oh, there is an eternity. There is a reality. I will turn and believe that. That's what he's saying. I didn't do it, but I know my brothers will if Lazarus would just go back, resurrected from the grave. That's all that they need. And then it will change everything. But Abraham reminds them, if they won't, hear God's words now in their life, they won't believe his works, though they be displayed right in front of them. Is that what he says? He says that in verse 31. He said to them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, the message of God, the revelation of God, the validity of God in front of them, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the grave. He says, they have all that they need in the word of God. They have an issue of unbelief, one that they may make, must make a choice of faith concerning. How do we know this to be true? Think about the one who's speaking the account. Did Jesus, the God-man, enter into human history? Yes, he did. Was it prophesied? Was it confirmed? Yes, it was. Did he teach and manifest clearly the revelation of God to sinners to restore the Jewish nation as their Messiah and to reach out to the Gentile world? Yes, he did. And what did the majority of people do with the revelation of God and even the works of God that were done before them? They unjustly murdered him. They mocked him. They criticized him. Ultimately, they murdered him. And he arises from the dead because he is the victor over death. And did that change and persuade everybody? Still no. You see, it's not an issue of needing more on God's end. It's not that we need more Bible or niftier proofs. It has always been an issue of faith or unbelief, repenting from what 
or who I trust and believe and look to and putting it in who God has said exclusively. Abraham reminds the rich man that it's not a rich poor issue. It's not a needing to see something fantastic or spectacular from God. It's you have what God has revealed about himself and us. Who will you believe? Who will you trust? What will you do in your decisions regarding what you have seen and or heard about who God's Messiah is, Jesus Christ? And so Abraham closes the conversation down, at least in the account we have from Jesus, by saying, they've got what they need. See, my friends, today, I would remind us, based on Jesus' vouching, that you and I have friends, we have loved ones, we have aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, neighbors, dental hygienists, plumbers, bankers, engineers, all around us, that death will come for them. And there's only two destinations that will happen, and they have what they need in the revelation of God. Further than that, they have what they need with you commissioned by God into their sphere of influence to tell them about the revelation of who Jesus is. And so this morning, my friend, if hell is real, if there is eternal conscious torment awaiting somebody who is justly judged as unrighteous, as a rejecter of Jesus Christ, if that is a reality, then today I have a few thoughts to close with. If you're here today, and you say, I'm hearing all this about Jesus Christ. I'm hearing this about eternity. I'm hearing this about judgment. I'm hearing this about separation or reconciliation. And I'm not sure where I would spend eternity if I don't make it out of the parking lot today. Can I say something to you today? Can I invite you? Can I plead with you even? It will not matter who you are or what you've done in this life. It's an issue of belief or unbelief. Not intellectual assent, friend. Not I've heard the story of Jesus. Not I even believe there's a God and I'm a good person. It is an issue of, well, I put my trust, my confidence, my faith in who God has said is the only one capable and able of forgiving and saving me. If you're here today and you say, I do not have a relationship with Jesus. I don't know what it is to be forgiven by Jesus. I want to invite you personally to find out about him today right from the scriptures. We have it here, and we're glad to share it with you. Not our tradition and our opinion as a Baptist denomination or as a Baptist church, but right from the Bible. If you're here and you've been here a long time or this is your first time, and today, right now, the Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart about the issue of eternity Today, we're going to invite you to find the answers that your heart longs for right from the Bible. And we're going to do that in a moment. Today, if hell is real, I'd like to speak for Christians for a moment and ask you, who are you engaging about their eternity? I'm, I'm not asking you, who do you talk to on Mondays? I'm not asking you, who you know perhaps is not a Christian, I'm asking you who you are engaging. That's our command. Go and teach. We are to engage others about the message of Jesus Christ. In fact, we said it very sternly in the student ministry this morning, and I'll say it again here. The New Testament cannot and does not validate somebody professing to be a Christian who does not profess to others the gospel message of Jesus Christ and engage them about their eternity. It will not validate such a profession. So the question needs to come back to us. Who are we talking to? As freed, forgiven, and commanded people, who are we talking to and engaging about Jesus Christ? It's as simple as asking, as we talked about in Bible study, leading questions. It's as simple as praying, God, will you help me today? Spirit of God, give me discernment and wisdom today. That is a prayer of faith. He will answer, friend. So if hell is real, who are you talking to this week about it? About Jesus Christ. 
But Christians, maybe let's take a moment and think about this. We may affirm intellectually and in biblical understanding the reality of hell, but I would maybe ask us to consider this. Do our priorities reflect that in how we are engaging others? Is that clear within our family's use of time that we're engaging others and it matters to us about eternity separated from God? Last thought. I would say take heart. If eternity away from God in conscious torment is a reality, if that's true, I would take heart this morning in this. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a degreed theologian. You don't have to be somebody who has supernatural ability or power. You know what Jesus said in this account? If you got the word... It's enough. Take heart. Oh, man, Pastor, you don't know how hard they are. I don't. But you keep asking questions. You keep engaging. You keep using what God gave you, the Word. And the Spirit will do what He promised He would do. Convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. He will work in their heart. He will use the truth of the revelation of God to testify to them of their need and the willingness and ability of Jesus to save and change their eternity. You don't need a wow factor. They don't need a wow factor from you. Take heart because you have the word and the spirit is proactive. And is there an eternity apart from Christ? There is. But you and I have the spirit of God the message of God, and the opportunity from God to tell others. You see, why do we have personal evangelism? Why should we be engaged in it personally or plurally as a church? There's a lot of great reasons. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus as our Lord. Jesus as our victor, absolutely. But may we never drop this one off and the sobriety that comes with it, the gravity that comes with it. He's also a righteous judge, and there is eternal conscious torment away from that. And there are people around us right now who are going to spend eternity somewhere. May we use the word, be yielded to the Spirit of God, and keep engaging them. Well, Pastor, I have, and I've kind of gotten shot down. Do it again. Well, they told me never again. Keep praying, keep looking, keep asking, keep seeking. Pastor, I'm new to it. I'm a little nervous about it. You have the Spirit, you have the word, ask questions, start somewhere. He'll help you. He promised he would. Let him work in our lives this week so you and I can talk about it. I told the teens this morning what it looked like for me this last week with somebody else's hands in my mouth. So what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I'm a pastor. Yeah. Oh, tell me about it. Okay. How'd you end up a pastor? Well, here's how, you know. And so with somebody else's hands coming in and out of my mouth, I'm talking about how I, as a teenager, thought I was moral, thought I was self-righteous, thought if anybody's going, I've been baptized, I'm going. And I heard the reality that Jesus, he died for me, a sinner. I put my trust, instead of my self-righteousness and religious works, in him exclusively. And he forgave and saved me. All right, if you're going on. It's that easy, friend. This week, it will be that easy for you. Let's have a heart in tune with the Spirit, ready with the Word, and engaging those about us about where they are going to spend eternity. And let's invite them to the opportunity to have their eternity changed. I'd invite you to stand with me this morning if you would. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as we have what our church calls an invitation. And what I'm inviting you to do is this. We invite you to respond to what you've heard. For some in the room this morning, it's what I said earlier. You are not sure where you'll spend eternity. You're not sure that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, a forgiving, saving, vibrant, real relationship. And right now I'm asking you this. No one's looking around. No one's going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to single you out. I'm asking you this. Can we take a few minutes to show you from the Bible the greatest news you'll hear all of your life? There's a Savior who loves you, who can forgive you and change you and save you today. Today, friend, if that's you today, I'm inviting you right now. Nobody's looking. 
Nobody's going to interfere. Nobody's going to embarrass you, single you out. We're inviting you to walk right out. With Somebody next to you, and you said, man, I, I want to go out, but I don't want to go out by myself. Why don't you just tap them, ask them to walk with you real quick. Have you called me? Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That concludes what is our formal invitation, where we kind of give a very clear path, as it were. But I do want to call you to this today. If you're here, man or woman, you've been here a long time, it's your first time, and you say, I didn't walk out. I do have questions. Right now, it's undeniable what's going on in my heart. I can't explain it, I can't express it, but I know today I need forgiveness. I want that relationship you talked about. I want that assurance you talked about. All you have to do is slip up next to me and let me know. CMO, our staff pastor, we're glad to talk with you. We're not going to embarrass you. We want this as much as you do for you. We want to start that conversation with you today. If you're here and you say, there's somebody heavy on my heart, Pastor, I would love to know that so I can pray with you about that this week. If you wouldn't mind stopping and let me know also, let Pastor Jordan know, let one of our deacons maybe know, and we would want to pray and partner with you about that this week as well, okay? I'm going to ask you to be seated. We're going to take up our morning offering. We take up offerings um, because we, as people who have been liberated from the power of sin, we don't have a subscription to covetousness anymore. We have a new value on money and its power in this realm and the next. And so this morning, we're asking that Christians, if you're our guest, we're not asking this of you. We're asking that you and I, as followers of Christ, would demonstrate our faith in him as our provider, our thankfulness towards his care in our life, and our belief that the gospel does matter and getting it out into our community and beyond our community in the world through missions is a priority to me, one I'm going to ask for his grace to enable. And so, as we have our offering this morning, we're calling each of us to exercise our faith and give towards the Lord. You can do it on your phone. You can do it online. You can do it through the plate. We want to call you and challenge you with that opportunity that we have this morning. Father, may we have your grace to give. May we let you work through our lives in a dramatic way with your finances, and may none of us harbor doubt or harbor a quenching of the Spirit regarding your finances for your gospel to go forward. May we enjoy the richness of your grace in this area. May we enjoy the liberality that comes with an eternal perspective on finances. And may we enjoy this week in you with your Spirit with your word engaged in what you've called us to, and part of that is talking to others. May that be our yielded heart today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen.
Again, thanks for joining us today. If you need information about anything that you have seen, connect with us at includefaith.org or on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. A reminder that there will be no evening service tonight as we begin our Kids Blast and Teen Extreme programs. 